Right, let's try and get that right. <laughs> Hello and welcome to uh, a fully charged lockdown news episode. Uh, as you can see, I'm busy virtue signalling. I'm sorry, sewing masks. Uh, these are not for frontline health workers. I wouldn't have the skill set or the materials to make proper, uh, you know, surgical masks that could be used in a hospital. These are for friends and family and neighbours, uh, and they're very, very basic. I've done. I've been toying with different designs. Uh, that one was my first one, and he, that that goes like that. I think it's quite good. Uh, I, I didn't have any elastic when I made that. I've now got elastic, so that would have elastic hoops around the more recent versions of that one. Uh, made out of old bed sheets. Uh, fine weave cotton. Very good. This is the more recent one. This is based on a design that my sister's developed. I haven't got this quite right, but essentially that goes there. And then that hooks under your chin. Hang on, let's get that right. That, that, that. And then that hooks with the elastic round round your ears. The same thing. So that will uh, go like that. I'm really being comfortable. One of the downsides. It mists up your glasses when you're in the supermarket. It's for wearing in public, when you're out in public. What it won't do is stop you catching the virus. What it might do is if you've got it, but you haven't got any symptoms, you don't know that you've got it, and you go out shopping and you cough, it will protect other people from you. It's to protect other people. It's not for you. It's to protect other people from you. That's what these are for. We should all be wearing them. We all will be wearing them very soon. Yeah, what's interesting is, I didn't even notice this. This is my daughter's sewing machine. We haven't used it for years. Uh, it's made by Toyota. This is a self-threading, self-sewing machine. A bit like their cars that are self-charging hybrids. This is a self-threading hybrid sewing machine. Brilliant technology. No, it's a very good sewing machine. I'm really pleased with it. That's not what I'm here to tell you about. I've got a few interesting stories. Uh, from the world of um, electric vehicles and clean technology and a very, very short uh, film review at the end. Marvellous. So for years and years and years, people have been saying to me, "Where? why can't I get an electric estate car? I want an electric car that's an estate car or, for our North American viewers, a station wagon. Uh, and of course, what's happened to oh, a Chinese company that owns MG are making the MG5, a station wagon slash estate car. It's going to be on the streets of the UK later this year. It is going to cost around £25,000 or €29,000 after the government grants. It's assumed to have a 52.5 kilowatt hour battery and an 85 kilowatt motor. I've no idea what the range is. I've no idea what the car is like. As soon as we get the chance to uh, to get a press car, we'll be all over it like a rash. So there are estate cars coming. There's also, uh, we, we will be seeing it very soon, small, small, you know, I've got a bit obsessed with small, light, cheap electric cars. I think they're really, really important. So that is coming to Fully Charged uh, soon. Hang on a minute. I'll be with you in a second. Just doing this seam. <laughs> Now, I think this story really caught my eye. I'm sure you are aware of it. The collapse in the oil price. Now, it's pretty obvious why it's happening because we're not using our cars. What is extraordinary is for the first time in human history, the price of oil went negative, which meant that if you had some oil and you didn't know what to do with it, you had to pay someone else to take it off your hands. Isn't that just mind-bogglingly extraordinarily insane now this does happen with electricity as some of you will know uh, there are often negative prices of electricity in uh, particularly in germany i think in denmark certainly in the uk it's happening more and more often that is when there is a plethora of renewables and not much demand there's like too much electricity everything gets turned off how do we balance it this is the challenge that we have uh, this century it's not oh uh, renewables don't work they're intermittent no they produce too much electricity not always at the right time we're going to get onto that particular topic thorny issue some for some but the oil price is extraordinary here's my take on it because obviously it's temporary the price is going to go back up people are going to make continue to make money out of oil that's that's goes it goes without saying what has happened is 
huge amounts of the world's population, and this is global, this isn't just one particular country or one particular city, huge amounts of people have noticed, they have noticed with their noses and their mouths and their lungs that the air is cleaner. In fact, there's some people who do monitoring air who say this is the cleanest air in the globe since before the Industrial Revolution. But now I think people are going to forget. As soon as the lockdown is lifted and it's going to happen slowly by degrees, people will get back in their cars, vroom, vroom, ah, I'm in my car again, vroom, ah. Excellent. Uh, they might notice they have to pay a lot for the petrol, even though the, the oil price is low, the petrol prices in the pumps are not going to go down that much, not down to negative prices. Here's a key, key difference between a fossil burning combustion car and an electric car. There are people, they're doing it right now, who have uh, variable energy tariffs that get paid to charge their electric cars. So they do experience negative fuel costs. They get paid to use it because there's too much electricity. You've got to balance the grid. You need to get rid of it. You pay people to use it, you know, off peak times. They use it. That balance helps balance the grid. It helps the grid and it helps the economy to pay people to charge their cars. You cannot and you will never do that in a petrol or diesel car. I'm just saying that little extra side point. Longer term, people are going to recall and I'm going to be constantly reminding them for years, for the rest of my life, do you remember what the air was like during the lockdown? That was because we didn't burn much fossil fuel. We could do that now. We could stop burning fossil fuel now. Let's move on. Let's find technological solutions that mean we don't have to burn stuff. That is the critical bottom line. Or we burn a lot less. We're never going to get to a point where we don't burn anything, but we burn a lot less and we live better and we breathe better as a result of it. Of course, to be able to wean ourselves off fossil fuel, we need a, a realistic and a plausible technological alternative to develop. Which brings me to another story that I've just seen since the lockdown. Samsung, who you may have heard of, have now developed a 900 watt hour per litre solid state lithium iron battery. It's a difficult thing to understand, particularly when you read a, a, a fact like 900 watt hours per litre. Uh -huh. You mean batteries are liquid? No, they're not. It's the capacity, it's the size. Why do it in litres? I don't know. It's the same argument I've got with. Uh, uh, automobiles, electric cars, I want to know how many miles or kilometres they can go on one kilowatt hour. That really helps me understand how much energy I'm using. So I would like them to say how many watt hours per kilogram. Well, strangely enough, a litre of water weighs a kilogram. So it is 900 watt hours per kilogram. <laughs> Unless they're talking about oil, because that's only 800 grams per, per litre. Oh, the world's confusing if you're not terribly intelligent like me. So anyway, the only way we can really compare that is current lithium uh, iron technology, current batteries, the sort of thing you'd have in a Tesla or an electric car or your phone, generally are between 200 and 400 watt hours per kilogram. 900 watt hours per kilogram is a massive increase. But the more important thing is what this battery is made of. So it's made of more common elements. Because it doesn't have a liquid electrolyte like all current batteries do, there's less chance of fire. It is smaller. It is lighter. It is more energy dense. Those three things are critically important. So what this means is in my Tesla Model 3, which has a 75 kilowatt hour battery, you could effectively put a battery that was double the size slightly more than double the size possibly in the same space and it would be lighter so you could have a 150 kilowatt hour battery in a tesla which would give it a range of getting on for 600 miles on a charge now i'm not suggesting anyone does that i think that's stupid i think it'd be much better to put a smaller 100 kilowatt hour battery that's lighter in a tesla model 3 or in any other car or even a 60 or 70 kilowatt hour battery that is smaller and lighter and cheaper they will last longer they can be charged and discharged more often so that is next generation batteries we're likely to see those commercially available in the next two to three years Beyond that, there's another report out uh, about John Goodenough. Now, John Goodenough was part of the group that developed the very first lithium-ion batteries, rechargeable batteries, back in the 1970s in Oxford in the UK. He's an American. The next generation they're developing, which is literally 10 years away. This is not going to happen very soon, but 10 years away. But they're already working on it, and I've heard about these things for a long time, is a se essentially a glass battery. I mean, I say glass. It's a ceramic oxide, so it's sort of pottery. It's a ceramic oxide electrolyte. It's a solid state battery. It would be a solid battery. It is it, focusing on materials that are much cheaper, much more abundant, much less ethically uh, challenging. 
and much, much cheaper. And these batteries will have literally like four times the energy density of current batteries. So let's just jump back 10 years to my Nissan Leaf, which I did a review about recently in the garden. Uh, you know, and all the drawbacks and the difficulties of that very first generation electric car. And then we look at the cars today uh, for the same price or less. You get a car that does 250 to 300 miles. It's far more reliable. It's far more energy efficient. Has a smaller, lighter battery with more energy in it. That's happened in 10 years. You imagine what cars are going to be like in another 10 years. That is the point of really what Fully Charged is about, is, how, is to trace how this technology is developing. And it is at breakneck speed, but some things take years to do. But when they come, they are game-changing and they will change the way we operate. So that's why I believe the fossil fuel industry is finished. It's dead. It's not because uh, of a sudden unprecedented uh, drop in demand like we're experiencing at the moment. It's because another technology will come along that is better and cheaper and lasts longer and is less damaging to the human beings that surround it. And here's something to consider just before I do my final little film review. Each period of human history, the, the development is dependent on the fuel. It's always the basics. It's about the fuel that powers that 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 part of human history. So for millennia, it was wood. You burn wood and uh, you get heat and you do cooking or whatever. Uh, then it was coal. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it was coal. Very much in this country was the, the forefront of that. We were the, we were the Saudi Arabia of the, of the 18th and 19th century. Um, coal was absolutely the thing that drove the Industrial Revolution. In the early part of the 20th century, it became oil. Oil was the critical thing that every country needed to power its, its technology and drive it forward. Huge changes we saw due to the result of people discovering and refining oil and all the other products that oil produces. And then in the 1960s, when I was a child, it was nuclear. Nuclear was the future. Everything was going to be nuclear powered. The electricity would be too cheap to meter. It would be so cheap, you'd be giving it away. That hasn't panned out quite as we expected. Uh, and that's really what's holding back nuclear power now. It's not, you know, you can say it's because it's unsafe or that what about the waste and all those. It's just too damn expensive and it's centralised. You can't have lots and lots of little nuclear power stations. I wish you could because there are designs for that, but they are so expensive. What has emerged in the last 20 years and particularly in the last five is the new technology that will replace all those previous ones, and which is, I believe, renewables. Renewables and storage, though that is the simple story. Just getting another seam in while I can. Oh, you've got to sew around your edges. But that's not the story that is told in this film that I've got to talk about. Uh, it's a film that has Michael Moore's name attached. Michael Moore, some, I'm sure, sure many of you know, is a, a very well-respected documentary maker in the United States, long and, uh, and very glorious history of making documentaries about uh, you know, the more rampant aspects of American capitalism and uh, American culture and gun culture and all those sort of aspects of you know, difficulties in the United States. Um, uh, and he's put his name towards this film. It's called uh, Planet of the Humans. It's on YouTube. I'm not going to post a link to it because I don't want to give it any free publicity because uh, although I'd say a quarter of this documentary is incredibly good, really, really important uh, points they make, really clear uh, criticism of the uh, total takeover of the environmental movement by uh, big corporate America by uh, energy companies that are greenwashing themselves as fast as they possibly can because they know the negative impacts of the work they're still doing. They haven't changed what they do at all. They still burn all the things that they burn. They still lie and cheat. It's just like uh, self-charging hybrids. It's like Dieselgate. It's like all those, you know, big corporations that make a lot of money that make these things that we, we rely on a lie. <laughs> That's, it's as simple as that. Uh, and then they make the people who work with them lie as well. So the likes of, you know, your Richard Branson, your Al Gores, uh, you know, very, and then even people who, are, who have you know, really spent their life trying to improve uh, the, 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 the environment for the human race, the people like Bill McKibben, but, you know, hugely undermined by what's going on in American culture. Notice I keep saying American. It's very American focused, very blinkered. There's nothing outside America as far as Michael Moore and his little team are concerned. It's all within America. And it's a critical film of what's going on in America. So that's fair enough. The mistake they make. So another area that they focus on, which I totally agree with, is, is the criticism of biomass. You know, soaring down trees, burning them in a power station to make electricity. That is not sustainable or renewable. You know, it, it, and, and the arguments about it being better for CO2, such nonsense, such spurious greenwash. 
uh, uh, ethanol. Let's grow sugarcane and make ethanol. We should be growing food for people, not fuel. How unutterably Stone Age. And they criticise that, and they're right to, but they conflate that with renewables, and that's where it all goes wrong. That's where this film unravels in the most unseemly, grubby, sordid, tawdry way. It turns what could be a brilliant documentary about the con job that's being pulled on the American people by big corporate America into a tacky, tawdry, second-rate, badly put together, it's badly made, this documentary, uh, about, you know, renewables, clean energy, clean technology, electric vehicles, batteries, solar, wind. They're all the same. As far as Michael Moore and his very, very badly informed or deliberately in, uh, misinformed colleagues uh, state, uh, they conflate all, all that green stuff together. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, burning biomass is about as clean as, uh, I'm not going to say anything rude, a non-clean thing. It is not clean, it is not sustainable, it is not a green energy source. That's a con, that's a lie, that's the same as saying self-charging hybrid. So, they conflate all those things, which is a massive mistake, but here's the problem they had. They couldn't conflate them with contemporary footage or interviews with people who are involved in, in renewable energy now. No, 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 they go back 10, sometimes 15 years with, uh, they've been filming this stuff a long, long time ago. They go to a car launch, an electric car launch. Impressive. Uh, it's the, um, the GM Vault, which was released in 2010. So they go back 10 years, talk to people from General Motors who have no idea about anything to do with the electricity grid or batteries or electric. They don't know anything. They talk to them and they find out that the electricity that powers these cars comes from coal. Oh, please. Are you still droning on about that old Oh dear, you know, that's that. And then you, so you watch that bit, and you go, this film is, they don't know what they're talking about. They do not know what they're talking about. They look at solar panels that are only 8% efficient. The cheapest, rubbishest solar panels today that you can buy are 25 to 30% efficient. 8% efficient was 10 to 20 years ago. They show an image of wind turbines that were all falling to bits that were in Hawaii, that were decommissioned in 2006. They were desperately going around to try and find negative images because the, the latest stuff is very positive and they don't know what they're talking about. So they've totally denigrated what could have been a fascinating film with their tawdry, ridiculously badly, shoddily put together tatty propaganda. That is my review of this tawdry, sordid, dirty little film. Now, I want to thank some wonderful Patreon supporters who support this channel, who understand the importance of moving on technologically. There is not a solution to all the world's problems that we can do with technology. We also need to live with each other and work out how to trust each other and live with each other. And there's a lot of other issues. But one of the issues that this show focuses on is the technological issues, is the changes in science and technology that are generally, and we should be pushing for them to be so, generally to the benefit of the human race. So here are some wonderful people who understand that and support this show for $10 a month or more. Crazy! Anyway, they are Richard Laxton, Stephen S. Lowe, Laura Sanborn, Tony Bosworth, Nathaniel Stubblefield, Rat Feast, Derek Riley, Jeremy Roebuck, Stephen Lazick, John Zaruba Jr., Jens Bauman, Paul Conway, Stephen Surtees, Simon Price, Tim Crutchley, Simon Pitkin, Liam Mycroft, Bill Wilbur, Paul Rickards, and Robert Xavier Benencore. Thank you so much for your support. As always, I don't want to go on about it, but it is extremely, extremely valued, particularly at the moment. It is pretty tough to keep going, but we're doing our best. There's some great shows actually to come, so I'm really pleased. There's some really interesting stuff coming. Uh, please do subscribe to this channel. You know, why not? Uh, have a look at the membership thing that we're just starting. That's quite exciting. And uh, as always, if you have been, thank you for watching. Oh, <laughs>